Um, all right, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be down here to talk to you today. And uh, my understanding is that uh, presentations down here are uh, more often discussions, so I would actually encourage that. So happy to answer questions uh, as I go along. Uh, before I dive into my slides, there's really three things uh, I would love to impart to you today. Uh, the first one I have no slides for, but I've been working on climate change for 25 years, and it has uh, become a pretty significant moral issue for me. And there's many ways that you can look at that. Uh, but one of the ways I look at it is when I drove down here today, I was up at 5 o'clock, so I'd get here on time, is I put a bunch of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I got all the benefit of driving down here, but that's going to be impacting our climate system for uh, centuries uh, to come. So I get the benefit. I'm putting the impact on uh, future generations. I also think about that in terms of it's those who are most vulnerable who are going to suffer the most. Um, so it's those who are young, those who are old, uh, those who are sick, and those who are uh, lowest down on the socioeconomic rung. Uh, the second thing is, I think we really have to get beyond this conversation of the economy versus the environment, especially here in, in New England. We have to think about the economy and the environment. And I would uh, argue that our economic well-being in the future actually is predicated on our dealing with this issue. And I think we can lead the nation and the world if we really want to figure out this problem. It would be really good for jobs, it would be really good for innovation, and I think it would be really good for this region. And the, the third point uh, is uh, I, I'm going to uh, sort of propose this hypothesis. It's coming out of uh, some conversations today. Uh, but I think the only way for New England to really solve this problem is to have its, its institutions of higher education get far more involved in actually figuring out how to develop those solutions, both on the uh, adaptation side and both on the mitigation side. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about engagement. So three uh, sort of themes running through what I'm going to talk about today. Um, uh, before I dive in, I thought I might uh, share a couple of pictures from my latest adventure. So when I'm not actually talking about climate change in New England, I am by training an ice core paleoclimatologist. That's how I really got my start. So I'm a geochemist by training. And uh, this past year, we uh, actually drilled uh, a suite of ice cores from uh, Denali National Park off a mountain called Mount Hunter. So this is Mount Hunter. If you're really a good rock climber, you actually go up and you climb the Cauliflower Ridge right here. Uh, that's not what we did. We just went up and got on helicopters and uh, flew up uh, to our drill site. So there's uh, Denali. Uh, there's Foraker. This is the north uh, peak of Hunter. This is our afternoon, uh, late evening ski slope that we'd come up and do a couple of runs from. But this is this beautiful little ice cap that we found uh, that flows uh, in both directions. So it flows off here, and way down in the distance there is our little camp where we drilled two cores uh, to bedrock, 208-meter uh, uh, cores uh, down, to the, down to the bottom. That was seven years of actually uh, writing proposals and doing reconnaissance to find the perfect place to drill a, a core. And our goal here is uh, to actually recover. We're, we should get a 1,000-year record, and we're going to reconstruct precipitation up in uh, central Alaska, for which we really don't have any uh, solid records. We did a lot of uh, work with um, GPR uh, uh, radar to actually figure out where exactly to drill the core. And we get these, these beautiful sets of images. And this is going sort of from the south to the north. So actually, if I go back here, that's, uh, that, that radar profile goes along the ridge here. So the ice flows that way. So the ice is flowing into and out of this figure, flowing this way. And so you can see we drilled our core in one of the deepest parts, but right exactly on the divide uh, where the ice is moving apart. You can see some weird reflections in here, which we actually think are buried crevasses, which is a whole other interesting uh, problem in a separate little research project. Uh, this is our little uh, camp up there. Uh, this is our uh, drill tent. Completely powered our entire drilling operation with renewable energy, uh, solar panels, and uh, wind turbines. We had a big 5 kilowatt Honda generator up there. Uh, that worked really well, but we didn't need it because um, the sun and the wind actually did better than we expected up there. And here's the portable drill. It all has to break down and fit into a helicopter. Uh, this was one that we developed actually about 15 years ago with a separate NSF-funded grant. Uh, I would say there's rarely a singular picture you can use to encapture an entire field program. But this is it. This is the bottom of our 208-meter core. And you can see we're going from the clear ice, which dominates the 207.7 meters above this. And you can see we're getting at right down to the glacier. Uh, but we flew those out to base camp and then back to Talkeetna. And we trucked them to Denver. And we cut them up. And just last Friday, they arrived 
at UNH. So they're safe and sound in my freezer, collaborative program with uh, Dartmouth and um, uh, University of Maine, uh, and we'll start analyzing those and should have some results in a couple of years. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so we've done uh, uh, a suite in um, uh, the southwestern Yukon Territory around Mount Logan. So we actually drilled, uh, we, I didn't personally, but our team, we got a, a core from the summit at 18,000 feet. We got, uh, the Japanese got a core at 14,000 feet, and we got another core at Eclipse at uh, 10,000 feet. And one of the main goals was to look at precipitation variability in, in those cores. Uh, and then we also did it on the Penny Ice Cap in the Eastern Arctic, but it wasn't really as successful. And there's been a really big NASA program really trying to understand the dynamics of the Greenland ice sheet. So they've done quite a bit of sort of cores all around Greenland to figure out how the accumulation rate has varied with time because they want that to calibrate their various satellites that measure the uh, altitude and the reflectivity, et cetera, of the surface. So yeah, it, reconstructing snow accumulation is a pretty, uh, I would say, standard measurement on ice cores. You just have to go where there's enough snow. Um, so here's, uh, here's one of the, here's, this is our rationale on why we drilled uh, on Denali. This is actually a correlation coefficient map from uh, uh, annual precipitation in Talkeetna, which is uh, not far from Mount Hunter. It's where we do all our uh, logistics from. And then we're, uh, we're comparing it to other uh, instrumental records from uh, around Alaska. And then in stars, I'm showing you the ice core records that we have. So up here, you can see Talkeetna, Alaska, June to October uh, precipitation with a shallow core that we got several years ago, and we've got a reasonably good correlation, even though they're separated by about 12,000 feet and 45 miles. We think we can get a, a, a representative measure of uh, snow accumulation, but you can also see there's this really big bullseye pattern, and we can do probably get a reasonable record from central Alaska, but it's not going to tell us a lot of what's going on down here, say at Mount Washington, at Mount Waddington, where Eric Steig and his colleagues at UW actually have uh, a core. It's the completely opposite sign. So really important to develop these regional records of climate change, so we better understand what happened in central Alaska. And the thousand years will take us through the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. All right. That was just what I did for fun uh, this summer. And here's uh, what I'm really going to talk about today is this notion of uh, going local, really trying to better understand regional climate change to help decision makers. And I want to start this off uh, with this definition that we've developed at the University of New Hampshire of Engaged Scholarship. I've actually talked about this uh, with several people today. Uh, but this is really, uh, I would say, a place where higher education has a tremendous opportunity to help society solve some significant problems. It's not about going out and being a consultant and just figuring out, just helping them, but it's also about getting scholarship about it. So you can see in the definition, sort of mutually beneficial is a really important a part of the definition. A collaboration with community partners to apply relevant knowledge to directly benefit uh, the public. And I would uh, argue that much of the research I've been doing over the course of the past 10 years on New England actually falls in this realm of engaged scholarship. Uh, so this is a question that I ask a lot of my audiences, is uh, were you ready for the storm? And I was just talking with Guy the, Guy the video guy uh, about how about this time last year uh, we were actually suffering. You guys had something on the order of a foot to a foot and a half of snow down here for Snowmageddon, Snowtober, don't know what the meteorologist down here uh, called it, but lots of power outages. People started to go out and, and, uh, and buy generators. So the question is were we ready for that storm? And I would argue that we weren't because we'd never really experienced a foot of snow at the end of October when there were still leaves on the trees, so those trees would fall over and, uh, and hit the power lines. We've had several large floods uh, in uh, southern New Hampshire and coastal Massachusetts. That's uh, one. Uh, we weren't really uh, ready for that big precipitation event at all, and it wreaked havoc uh, in southern New Hampshire. Certainly not ready for Irene that came through and hit Vermont and all of that uh, water. And while they've tried to rebuild, I think what I've been hearing from most of them is FEMA wouldn't let them rebuild the way they wanted to. They had to rebuild the way it was, which is similar to what we've heard Chris Christie talk about New Jersey. We weren't ready for the storm, but when we come in with our billions of dollars, we were rebuilding the way that it used to be, although there are some uh, examples there. All right. So that's my framing. I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change. I, it's great you've had some climate modelers here before me because I'm not a climate modeler. I just use the output from climate models. Uh, so great you've had, um, uh, what's his name from Columbia, Horton? 
Does he talk to? Yeah, and then uh, you had Linda Mearns here. So I'm going to talk more about the results than about uh, the models. I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, but like any good paleoclimatologist, at one point I asked the question, so how has climate changed across the Northeast over the last hundred years? And I couldn't really find an example anywhere. So we collected all of the available meteorological data, did a pretty significant quality assurance, quality control on this. Actually, Adam Wilson, who's now here, was a graduate student who helped us out with these, uh, our, our first effort at this. Uh, so here's wintertime uh, temperature trends across the Northeast going back to 1895 up to the present. The blue is the year-to-year -year variability uh, in, uh, in temperature. And it's pretty clear that if you don't like one winter in New England, just wait because the following winter is certainly, almost certainly going to be different. But you can see this long-term trend of uh, temperature increase. By the way, I don't use scientific units anymore because I'm almost always talking to the public and they don't understand centigrade and centimeters. So I've put everything into Fahrenheit, so I hope you bear with me. Um, uh, but you can really see that the rate of warming has increased substantially over the course uh, of the last uh, four to five decades. In fact, it's doubled so that we've seen temperature increases across uh, much of the region on the order to three to four uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So the size of the dot represents that linear interpolation of the data from 1965 to 2008. In our paper, we did a, a pretty significant sensitivity analysis to see you know, does it really matter what year you start the trend in? Is it 1960 all the way up to 1975? And it doesn't really change much. It's a pretty robust finding. And you can also see that it's, it's robust across the entire region, right? The whole region has been warming significantly. And three to four degrees Fahrenheit is uh, a big deal. If you've been living here, I'm, I'm sure you have seen the change in a wintertime climate over that time period. Another thing we've looked at is extreme precipitation events, and we've defined these a whole bunch of different ways. I'm showing you the results of, of one of these analyses, and it's trends in four inches of precipitation in 48 hours. And we do 48 hours because we arbitrarily cut meteorological records at midnight or at 7 o'clock in the morning. So you often get a storm that lasts a short period of time, but may actually go over that split. So uh, we look at it in 48 hours. And so what you're seeing is uh, the change over five decades of events uh, per decade. And so uh, you're seeing in many cases, especially sort of where we're at in uh, coastal New Hampshire, coastal Maine, and uh, Massachusetts, not so much down here, uh, but uh, on, the, on the Cape and in other region, we're seeing this significant increase of sort of 2.5 to 5 to 7.5 events. So traditionally, we get two to four of these per decade. So we're seeing an increase on the order of two to four to six per decade, more than a doubly of extreme precipitation events. And when that rain falls on watersheds that were developing and creating more impervious surface, it ends up in more floods across the region, which is exactly what we've experienced. Here's another way to look at that, just a, uh, a record from uh, Durham, New Hampshire, four-inch precipitation events by decade. The average, as you go back in time, was sort of on the, on the order of one to two to three events per decade. And you can see we're seeing this steady climb. So we're now up to essentially one event per year with no signs of that uh, slowing down in the future. Another way to look at the way uh, our precipitation has changed is to look at uh, the information that engineers use for design storms. And in this case, the 24-hour, 100-year rainfall design storm. If you go and talk to most engineers, they'll be very familiar with this uh, uh, National Weather Service technical paper 40, TP40, rainfall frequency analysis. And uh, it was sort of these maps that you had to interpolate from. And for coastal New Hampshire, that design storm uh, uh, was, uh, you had to design sort of anything that you were building uh, for, uh, to deal with 6.3 inches of water uh, in a 24-hour period. That was a 100-year uh, design storm. And that was developed on data collected, meteorological data collected from 1938 to 1957. So that is still in use today. And the engineers I talk to say, well, maybe I'd use something else, but by law, I'm actually obligated because it's been sort of embedded in the way that engineers work. It's really difficult to change that culture. But uh, recently, um, uh, Northeast Regional Climate Center at Cornell has developed what's being called the, the Cornell Atlas, which actually updates this analysis up to include data up through 2008. So the design storm in uh, southeastern New Hampshire now is 8.5 inches. And a few enlightened engineering firms use that number, but most still use 6.3. And the question I ask is, what other decisions, significant decisions, do we make based on data that was collected uh, before uh, the 1960s? I would say not many. That's even for the, the young among you, that's even before the internet was developed. 
Uh, so yet another way to look at how our climate has changed is to look at how much money uh, the states in the New England states have actually requested from the federal government for presidentially declared disasters and emergency declarations. Uh, so everything is in 2012 uh, millions of dollars here. And you'll see that it has uh, increased significantly. I actually have to update this, but as I was getting the data, like the government shut down. <laughs> And I couldn't go back in time. So for New Hampshire, I have it back to, to 1990. And outside of 1998 with the big ice storm that we had, it tends to be uh, pretty low. Um, uh, but you can see sort of big storms in, in 05, as, 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 uh, especially affecting Massachusetts. That was big uh, flooding. That was the Mother's Day storms, Patriot Day storms here. And then you can see uh, a huge hit that Vermont took associated with Irene and then uh, a little bit of Sandy. This one was a big uh, March precipitation event that affected lots of Rhode Island. But you can see we're beginning to ask for lots more money. So these weather events that are affecting the region are actually having a significant impact on our society. And once again, that's not just because climate's changed, but it's also because we built in a whole bunch of vulnerable areas. And we're probably causing uh, more problems with flooding because of what we actually paved. Uh, we've also looked at climate change across the region by collecting ice out dates. So we haven't done this. People collect ice out date records and they've actually been collected by uh, the USGS folks who work up in Maine. So here's two of my favorite. There's uh, Lake Winnipesaukee uh, on the top. So we've got ice out dates going back to the late uh, uh, 1880s. And, and that's defined as the day that the Mount Washington, which is a tour boat, can get into every port. Uh, on the little tour that it does. So it's a pretty, been a pretty solid uh, definition over time. And there's another one uh, on Lake Sunapee. And you can see that since 1970, the ice uh, is coming out of, from those lakes earlier and earlier. This is a particular significance to me because I love to play pond hockey. It's my pond hockey team over here. I wouldn't think many people had pond hockey teams, but there's this great event called the uh, Pond Hockey Classic that occurs on Lake Winnipesaukee. And back here, not this past winter, but the winter before, uh, we actually couldn't play because the ice had not come in by February 1st in central New Hampshire, that really wretched winter that we had not too long ago. All right, and I'm sure you're all aware, uh, especially living not so far from the coast, that our seas are continuing to rise. This is uh, three tidal gauge records from Portland, uh, Boston, and New York. You could see uh, pretty significant uh, sea level rise a little bit faster uh, recently in Boston and New York compared to Portland, because Boston and New York are, are experiencing coastal subsidence, and Portland is not so much. All right, so that's how climate's changed. Uh, the big question, I would argue, is how is climate going to change in the future? Uh, so this is, uh, I would say, some relatively uh, old results now, but I was involved with a group of 50 people uh, that participated in the development of this Northeast Climate Impact Assessment, and I worked with Catherine Hayhoe on the climate part of this, and then we actually had teams that looked at the impacts of climate change on a whole variety of sectors. Uh, so we published uh, what's, what's becoming, a, I think, a pretty well-cited paper in Climate Dynamics in 2007 about climate and hydrological change across the Northeast. And then I added a special edition of 14 papers in adaptation and mitigation of climate change. So if you want to get lots of details, uh, you can go here um, or you can go to, uh, to the website. So I'm just going to sort of gloss over uh, a couple of, uh, of the results from this report. Um, but uh, in the intervening years, uh, we've, we've sort of developed what I would say, uh, we've sort of taken the climate assessment an additional step. So if you think about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as the global climate assessment, and then we've got the National Climate Assessment, which is still in draft. Are you part of that one? It's supposed to come out soon. Um, it was the draft report came out in the spring. I was involved in it a little bit, but haven't heard, but it should come out this year. Uh, uh, and then there's the regional climate assessments. We've actually gone and taken it down to the watershed scale because we've been getting requests from key stakeholders, resource managers, and planners uh, asking, you know, how is climate going to change in my backyard? Like, I can't, I can't use a northeast average. I need to know how temperature has changed in Portland, Maine. And so we've done one for the Great Bay watershed. We've done one for the Casco Bay watershed. I'm doing one right now for a sustainable communities initiative funded by HUD for the state of New Hampshire. And then we've also done uh, this uh, flooding uh, project in the Lamprey River, which I'll uh, talk about. So I've sort of mixed a lot of these results together to show you different examples of how climate assessments can be used to help drive decision making. We've taken the pretty standard approach that's been developed by the uh, IPCC of looking at different emission scenarios. Uh, uh, the IPCC comes up with a whole bunch more emission scenarios than this, and more recently they've come up with representative concentration pathways. 
uh, but we really simplify this for our stakeholders. So we've really looked at how climate might change in a high emission scenario, the A1FI, where global population grows to 9 billion by the middle of the century. We behave a little differently now and we help the developing world come out of poverty, but they do that by using a lot of fossil fuel energy. And then the B1, which is a low emission scenario, same population, uh, same socioeconomic scenario, we just invest in renewables and energy efficiency. So we use, then use these to drive a whole set of uh, global climate models, and then uh, we look at that output, and uh, I work with, again, my colleague at Texas Tech, Catherine Hayhoe, who has statistically downscaled that. So we've, we've, done a, we've looked at results from a little bit of dynamical downscaling, but really we're, we're focusing on uh, statistical downscaling, and we've really used output from three or four models, in part because they cover a range of sensitivities, in part because they do well in the Northeast, so they get the dynamics of sort of the jet stream and, the, and uh, how our um, how the um, polar front uh, moves uh, north and south. They capture the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, in a reasonable fashion. And so uh, we've done the downscaling both to meteorological stations but also uh, to a grid to answer uh, a series of different questions for stakeholders. So here's a pretty standard output from one of these assessments is you show people how regional temperature is going to change. All right, so this is my work here. Here's the historically how uh, temperature has changed across uh, the entire Northeast and then the colored lines represent uh, the model output. Uh, when I first started this, um, I, I suspect you're realizing this by now, I'm a data guy, I'm a paleoclimatologist, I collect ice cores. Uh, so I sort of said, you know, do your, does your global model output even capture the change that we see across the Northeast? And I was moderately surprised that the warming we've seen was actually captured by the ensemble mean, at least of the three models uh, we used uh, for this project. What the global climate models aren't capturing, even when you're downscaling it, is actually the significant temperature increase in winter. And I think that's happening because they're not getting the snow dynamics right. This is an ensemble mean of uh, output from three models that's then been... And the summer, the, the winter, when you do it on a seasonal basis, the winter's not showing four degrees? No. It's showing what? It's about half that. About two degrees. Yeah, about well, two degrees. So the mean change is about two degrees here. So that's yeah. It's, it's sort capturing of capturing the capturing winter warming, of, but only up two degrees. Uh, so, so about that, what the average is, yeah, as opposed to that enhanced warming in winter. Uh, the summer warming in the models. Yep. Yeah. So we're not capturing that that seasonal differentiate differentiation. Um, a couple things, I think you guys probably know this already, but I say it whenever I show this figure. By the middle of the century, right, 2040, 2050, there's really no difference between the models. That's an amount of warming that we're committed to. And so whether or not you want to say the word adaptation, you better start realizing that this is a world that really we cannot avoid and we're just going to have to deal with. And so better that we start thinking about that now so we can spend our limited resources in a wise way over a longer period of time. And then conversely, the decisions we make today about how we produce and how we use energy uh, globally are going to determine what the temperature is uh, by the end of the century. So under the low emission scenarios, we see temperature going up, you know, in the order of four to five to six degrees Fahrenheit at about twice that under the high emission scenario. And I would argue this is uh, change we can probably adapt to, and this would be really difficult to adapt to. So let's put that into a little bit more perspective. Uh, as part of the Northeast Climate Impact Assessment, we developed these sort of migrating state images. Uh, I hope you've seen them. They're, they tend to be pretty popular. Um, what are summers going to feel like in uh, Connecticut in the future? So under the higher emission scenario, uh, we would expect uh, that uh, Connecticut, uh, uh, by the end of the century, would feel uh, like it does in South Carolina or maybe Georgia today. Uh, so summers would be really hot. Uh, and probably pretty long. Conversely, under the low emission scenario, right, they're still going to feel like they currently do in uh, West Virginia. I'm not sure if the politics change with the climate. <laughs> um, uh, so it's going to be either some warmer or a lot warmer. You can also look at that in terms of the number of hot days. And so uh, we did that for a number of different cities. Here are the results for Hartford, Connecticut. Traditionally, uh, this area would experience about 15 days that felt like they were hotter than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, most of those days are probably going to have bad air quality too because those warm temperatures are often associated with uh, polluted air coming into the region. Under the high emission scenario by the end of the century, we'd expect uh, something, this is most of the summer, right? 75 to 80 days per year that felt that they were hotter than 90 degrees. So 90 days in the summer, it would essentially be um, a heat wave. Uh, 
Any way you look at extreme precipitation events, we see uh, them getting bigger and more frequent in the future. So overall, precipitation goes up, but uh, high magnitude, low frequency events increase as well. And there's sort of lots of ways that you can look at that, and I think it's an area where we need lots more research to really understand exactly what's going to happen. We also use uh, the VIC model out of Princeton, which is a water balance model, to look at how drought might also change in the future. Uh, so we're not just looking at inputs of precipitation, but minus uh, evaporation. So these are results uh, looking at, so th sorry, this is the historical record of drought, number of droughts in a 30-year period. You can see if we looked at short-term drought, one to three months, uh, we experience a drought sort of once every, sort of 10 droughts in a 30-year period on average. Under the high emission scenario, we would expect to see uh, somewhere on the order of 30 droughts in a 30-year period, which means we've got a drought every year, and that drought is certainly going to come in summertime as we precipitation. None of the models really show an increase in precipitation in summer, whether you statistically or dynamically downscale them, but we see dramatically increasing summertime temperatures, so we see more drought in summer. And I would argue that's something that New England uh, really isn't prepared to deal with. Uh, uh, you can see the changes are much lower under the low emission scenario. Uh, so we took that climate information, as I said, we gave it to a number of different sectors, so marine resources and coastal infrastructure and, and forests and agriculture. Uh, so you can all read it, go read about that if you want to. I'll just show one of my favorites, which is uh, the health of ski areas in the future. So we actually had specific models that were run for each ski area, sort of their slope, um, how much snow they got, and we provided the climate indicators. And we said that if a ski area was going to be viable in the future, it had to meet two criteria. It had to be open up for 100 days a year, which is a pretty good rule of thumb, and 70% of the time it had to be open at Christmas. So if it met both of those, it would be viable. Uh, one of those, it would be vulnerable. If it met neither of those, it would be highly vulnerable. So end of the century, under the high emission scenario, there's only one area that remains viable for skiing across the Northeast, and that's Sugarloaf and Sunday River. And I love skiing, so you can guess where I've bought my little winter cabin. Um, all other places either become uh, vulnerable or highly vulnerable, uh, which suggests that there's really not going to be much of a ski industry here uh, by the end, of the end of the century under the high emission scenario, and it's even worse for snowmobiling. Um, there's a vulnerability piece there too we could get into, but th those winter recreation areas really support a lot of rural New Hampshire. They tend to be not near big cities, so if you take that away, you begin to question what people in rural rural, uh, actually rural parts of uh, New England are going to work on, are going to do. All right, so this is, the more, this is the more recent climate assessment that we're doing for the state of New Hampshire because that Northeast climate impact assessment wasn't good enough for them. It's like, I want to know how temperature is going to change in my town. It's a really common question. So we've actually done a whole new set of uh, statistically, uh, uh, statistical downscaling, and we've used these temperature records going back to 1960 for about 35 stations across New Hampshire. So we're getting really good coverage, right? Lots of detail here. So I can tell somebody sort of, you know, in coastal New Hampshire what's going to happen, what has happened, and what will happen with their temperature, depending on the emission scenario, versus sort of a difference uh, up in uh, Coas County. And this regional uh, information is just really valued by a whole range of different stakeholders. I'm constantly asked for this. So how's temperature going to change? I've averaged this, so here we got southern New Hampshire, right? It's almost an identical curve to what I showed you, but I can now say it's for southern New Hampshire, and stakeholders actually are more willing to use this information than a New England-wide uh, average. And again, I put it into Fahrenheit so that they can understand it. You can see a big difference again between the high emissions and the low emissions uh, scenario. I can show the same picture for northern New Hampshire. It says pretty much the same story, but it's actually for northern New Hampshire stations. Can I just say when you, when you're standardizing these models, do you use all the instrument data up to the present and then stop using it? Or do you stop a few decades short of the present and test how will your model, your model to data line up? So, so I don't run the model, so that's important. But no, the way that we do it is we take 1960 to 2012 and we split that in half. So we train it on half of it and then we see how well it does. And then even before we do that, we do a significant quality assurance, quality control on the meteorological data because shockingly, there's a whole bunch of bad meteorological data out there. Uh, actually, it's almost, it's almost endless between the station moves and cities growing up around them and instrument changes and observers who just didn't want to read their instruments like every Saturday. Uh, which sort of introduces a bias into the, uh, into the data set. Uh, so no, we use uh, half for training and half for testing. And then we use that relationship uh, to actually downscale, statistically downscale. 
So we do it, we do the downscaling for individual stations because I love to tell people we use the data from your meteorological station and here's what the results show. And they get that much more than a grid cell. Right? It, it's, it, it, they, they intuitively understand that we've used data from a place instead of just chopping up the earth into a bunch of grid cells. Even though obviously you have to do that to run the models, but it's easier to explain to them. So uh, a very similar set of results to what I just showed you for Hartford, Connecticut. You know, number of days hotter than 9 degrees Fahrenheit. This is usually the <gasps> I get from the audience when I show them this graph because nobody wants to live in South Carolina if they're living in summers in New Hampshire. So southern New Hampshire, you know, uh, less than 10, sort of uh, 7 to 8 uh, days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then by the end of the century, you can see we're up around uh, 55 uh, uh, days per summer uh, hotter than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Northern New Hampshire, as you would expect, it's actually uh, a little bit less. So uh, the people in northern New Hampshire like this because they're not going to be as hot and they're, they're really not as used to heat as well because it tends to be uh, cooler up there. Well, I'll point out that don't get latitudinal gradients right. They, they usually underestimate temperature changes in higher latitudes under a particular global forcing. So that, that probably is, should be viewed as a minimum in, in, in models. You know, we can't reconstruct greenhouse climate uh, distribution very well. And I, I would add, we're still probably not getting the snow dynamics right on, on here. The winter's wrong. So you know, at a minimum, the winter's wrong. But the zonal gradients often can't be reconstructed well. But I'm not sure where that begins. I mean, where does that begin? Is it, would it begin at, uh, you know, do the gradients fail at very high latitudes, or is it more of a upper, upper mid latitudes? You know? It was mid to high. So we're not, we're not quite mid to high, right? We're, oh, mid, 45. Yeah. Yeah. 45. yeah. yeah we're, I think you're, I think we're, I mean, we may be in a zone where it's better, better, you know, modeled, but uh, certainly the latitudinal temperature gradients fail. That's the in paleo reconstructions. These models don't work well for zonal gradients as we move further north or south. I don't really have a feel for how much the um, the regional variability change changes. Um, how much larger are they than the changes among your ensemble members, for example, um, when you're looking on these kinds of scales? Uh, so I, I think that's a really good uh, question. You, you might sort of couch that in sort of how much uncertainty do you have around the results? And can I actually take a number that, that we've developed for all of the Northeast? Is that, is that reasonable for somebody sitting in New Hampshire? And if, if uh, I would argue that it's probably not that much better. I can give you a number for your specific location, but it's probably not that much better. But they want the number for their specific location. So we hear that again and again and again. And even though it's not sort of really any different from what I've provided for the regional temperature, it's, uh, I, 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 I don't think it's a lot better. Now when you get to precipitation, I would say it's probably a, even a little bit more challenging um, I mean, we are downscaling to specific meteorological records, so we are capturing that sort of on the ground spatial variability of p places that are, are wetter or not so wet. But I think we have research, especially on sort of this frequency of big precipitation events in the future and how they're going to vary regionally. Because the statistical downscaling we're doing is really making this big assumption that the connection between global climate and regional and local climate is going to stay the same. And, you know, we've done an or others have done regional climate modeling, dynamical downscaling, to show that that's probably reasonable in coastal New Hampshire. Uh, sorry, in, uh, in New England, maybe not. There's a bias that happens along the coast that modelers uh, haven't quite figured out. Um, so I don't actually know how much better the information is. It's a great point. But I know the people making the decisions need the local information in order to move forward. Does that answer your question? Is that shocking? <laughs> Um, all right, so that's uh, days hotter than 9 degrees Fahrenheit. We have, it turns out we actually have many more meteorological stations that have good precipitation records and then we have good temperature records, which was actually uh, sort of news to me. Uh, but now there's this wonderful new network that's run by NOAA called COCORAS, Community, Collaborative Community Rain, Hail and Snow Network. So we're getting a lot more actually useful information, but that didn't go back to 1960. We now have 300 people across the state of New Hampshire 
measuring precipitation, and about two-thirds of those record it daily. So we're getting much better uh, records of, uh, of, of variability in precipitation. So same thing, we downscaled to all of these uh, locations, and so I'm going to go ahead and do how our forage precipitation event is going to change uh, in the future. For both southern New Hampshire and northern New Hampshire, you can see that we, ha we see this increase over time. So here's a good modeling question, because I always get asked this question when I, I show this, uh, this model output to people, is that in the short term, the low emission scenario results in more extreme precipitation events than the high emission scenario, and I really have no idea why that's happening. I also say there's probably not a huge difference between what I'm, I'm showing you in terms of these models. And I could put uncertainty bars on it, but that are error or standard deviations or, or mean errors, but that really starts to confu confuse uh, a set of stakeholders that I work with. You can see that it appears that southern New Hampshire, right, is going to have more events uh, than northern New Hampshire, but that's driven in a big part because of, in the past, southern New Hampshire has had sort of, you know, 4.3 events per decade over the period 1980 to 2009 whereas northern New Hampshire has had a little bit more uh, than two. So that increase in the future is actually capturing uh, what's happened uh, in the past. And probably reflecting that, that southern New Hampshire tends to be much closer to the coast than northern New Hampshire does. I don't, I don't mean to go on about this, but, <laughs> but what would the error bars look like on that? What's the standard deviation? So we'd have, um, if I could, I, I don't have a, a picture of it here, but if you looked at the actual towns, uh, across northern New Hampshire. So if we're looking at the, at the standard deviation around the mean, um, from, from, so we get the ensemble mean output, and I look at all the different towns. There would be towns uh, up here that might have uh, one to two events on average per year, and some that had uh, 15. And then if you looked at the output from uh, the change from the ensemble mean, uh, the minimum and the maximum uh, would be uh, probably 30% around those. So if you look at the minimum value that comes out of any model for any given year and the maximum value, and you look at how that varies about the mean, it would be pretty significant. Um, and if somebody said, you know, should I be designing a system for 2070 where I have to deal with 12 four-inch precipitation events in the future, I'd say no. You need to be designing things where you're going to have more big extreme precipitation events in the future. And in fact, I would say just design it to the climate that you have now would be a much better step than designed to a climate that existed in the middle of the century, and we're still well behind on that sort of, I don't know if you guys are having that culvert discussion in your towns, but it's really dominating how big a culvert should we put in when we replace culverts. It's a big um, uh, sort of Department of Public Works question. So you have a higher, higher precipitation events, but you have drier, you have more drought. So this is just a calculation of B over P for summer months, is that the... So this is, so, so the drought comes out of the VIC model, and now we're just looking at precipitation. Right, right. so you're getting higher precipitation, but you're, I mean, so the, the, your models are, your calculation of drought is that the temperature eva evaporation is exceeding precipitation. These are events rather than, um, than, than average, uh, you know, rainfall. A number of events, but that doesn't speak to the, I'm sorry, yeah, it does yeah. speak. It's, it's greater than four inches in 48 hours. But that, I'm just trying to, I'm just wondering how to think about it because, uh, you know, okay, it's a storm event, it's flooding, is what you're talking about because it can't be absorbed into the soil. And so, and the, and the drought is calculating uh, E over P for soil moisture, and exactly. that's an average. And, uh, but on a seasonal basis, right? Or is that an that an annual? Monthly. We, Monthly. Yeah. But do most of these extreme precipitation events happen in winter? Uh, in the shoulder seasons in winter. So the, the answer to your question is that if you look at all this output, no, none of the models really show any increase in precipitation in summer. It tends to stay pretty flat. Okay. So we see an increase in precipitation in winter in the shoulder seasons. So the drought is really being driven by no increase in summer precipitation, increase evaporation. The, but overall, we get more precipitation. It goes up anywhere from sort of 10 to 30 percent, but in the other seasons, and actually primarily in winter. Um, and those are when the big precipitation events. And think about what's happened in terms of flooding, right? It doesn't really flood that much in summer. We're not getting the big precipitation events as much, but also there tends to be, right, the ecosystem can suck that water up much more effectively in the summer. 
average precipitation in the winter, is that, is that, I know that you are calculating a temperature, you are looking at, you know, your relationships for the snow, for your ski resorts, you know, are going, look, so precipitation was going down in the winter, or, or I should say melting versus precipitation was increasing through the winter in your scenarios, and that was the minimum exposure. I'm just trying to get all the, my, you know, balances right. You're, you're, we, you can't capture the recent warming in winter, so any estimate of winter, if winter effects is a minimum. It's conservative. Yes. And so, so you could very well be experiencing droughts in the winter as well, even though precipitation events are occurring in the winter. You just don't. There's uncertainty there. Most of these precipitation events are occurring in when? Once again, this is. A, the, the big events. Yeah, these big yes, events. Spring, the shoulder seasons in winter. Shoulder and winter. And you can't capture the warming in the winter. winter. So, you know, even though you're getting big events, it doesn't speak to droughts in the winter. Correct. And so, yeah, so um, a really important point is that, uh, uh, you know, models are useful tools and they're providing us this potential window into the future. Uh, but there's some pretty significant limitations. And another one is, you know, GCMs are not very good at capturing extreme events until the paleoclimate community says, by the way, you have to capture this really big extreme event that we've seen in the past. So there's, I think there's, you know, some potential significant thresholds that we might cross that the outputs from the, the downscale GCMs are not showing us as well. So uh, I think overall the conclusion is that we're looking at, at a set of probably minimum changes is right on. Uh, snow covered days, speaking of snow. Uh, so even though we're not capturing that, that warming winter, we do look at snow covered days. And this is, this is actually a pretty good measure from meteorological stations because people look out their window at a patch that they look at every day and say, does it have snow on it or not? Uh, so it's, 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 it's not an easy measure to mess up. Um, and so, you know, in, in most of uh, uh, southern New Hampshire, sort of 100 days of snow on the ground is a pretty good winter. And we see that uh, decreasing substantially under the high emission scenarios to about half that, whereas uh, we retain, you know, 80% of it um, under the low emission scenarios. And then in uh, northern New Hampshire, we don't see as much of a decrease, but a decrease uh, nonetheless. All right, so that's, uh, so I've showed you the results from the Northeast Climate Impact Assessment, the Northeast. I've showed you some results from a New Hampshire assessment, which uh, we're rolling out uh, this fall sometime. I'm going to transition to talking about, uh, well, how do you go from the extreme precipitation to more flooding? Uh, so this was a, a project uh, on assessing specifically flooding in the Lamprey River. And I, I said that's a, a picture from uh, the Patriots Day storm uh, in Newmarket. Uh, so uh, Lamprey River watershed, it's about 214 square miles. It's reasonably big for a New England watershed, uh, but it's not, you know, the Merrimack or the Connecticut. It drains in the Great Bay. So this is the area in, in southern New Hampshire uh, that it's looking at. And what we really focused on is what is going to be the change in, uh, in the size and magnitude, frequency, sorry, what's going to be the change in the magnitude of a 100-year uh, flooding event? And so to do that, you have to do two things. You can't only look at climate change, you have to look at land use change. And if there's anything I've learned over the last five years is that climate change is probably easier to deal with than land use change. Uh, so uh, what humans are going to do with the landscape in the future, uh, it turns out to be it's a really challenging uh, uh, scenar set of scenarios to develop. So what we did in this case, it this took us a year to sort of come up with a very simple representation, but we actually looked at how, we first started with population. We wanted to drive everything with population, but it turns out that uh, the ratio between the acres developed and population growth is changing over time, at least in southern New Hampshire. So people per capita are taking up a larger uh, piece of developed land as our population grows. Uh, which is not encouraging. So here's uh, the development for residential development and here's development for commercial development and we actually just put exponential curves through those so that by the end of the century the land that's developed actually occupies about half of the area of the watershed and we see this significant increase in commercial and industrial development. So we had to do that first, we had to build out the watershed uh, sort of, you know, how many, how many developments are there going to be? And then we actually had to lay that onto uh, the watershed itself. So we started with the total watershed, and then we eliminated places uh, where people couldn't put houses. 
and then we just sort of added uh, them to the, to the landscape. So we did a subtraction piece, right? We took out what the existing developed land was, although I'll talk about that in a bit. It, bit it, we took out anything that was wet, then we took out anything that was steep, and then we took out anything that was uh, conserved, and we said it's going to be conserved in the future. And then once we'd done that, we actually just uh, laid people onto the landscape. We started out with flat terrain, we moved to somewhat steeper terrain, um, and we built out closest to roads first. Uh, so we actually had a, a student that went around and found out what all of the existing zoning was in terms of residential and commercial development. We used that, so you know, more denser in, in urban areas, less dense. So here's land use in uh, 2005, and we built it out to 2050. You can see lots of development along the roads, and then uh, we took it out to 2100. And all the development occurs on the roads because we didn't let people build any roads. We just allowed them to develop uh, along those, uh, those existing roads. But you can see significant change across the watershed. Um, we also did allow uh, areas to redevelop with uh, low impact design, but I'm not going to talk a, a ton about those uh, results. Uh, we then uh, actually looked at climate scenarios to figure out how precipitation would change. And we, we again took uh, somewhat of an extreme here. Um, uh, I'll explain this table in a second. But we ran uh, uh, four GCMs, we downscaled them, and we looked at the single largest precipitation, 24-hour precipitation event that the GCM, that the downscaled GCMs provided us with as the biggest 100-year storm in the future. So it was actually from Lawrence, Mass, which is pretty close to the watershed, and it was 11.4 inches. So we've got sort of the, 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 the flood insurance studies or the flood, flood insurance rate maps are based on the 6.3 inches that I showed you from the TP40. We have current climate that's sort of 8.5 inches. We said that went out to 8, uh, 2050, and then 2100, the biggest storm was. So we've sort of bracketed this problem between what happens today and what might happen out at 2100. Uh, we have it both for land use now and for climate change. And then uh, the whole approach we took is one that's used uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers in their analysis for FEMA of floodplains, and it's really based on this uh, curve number. So it's a relationship between how much rain falls and how much uh, runs off. And these curve numbers represent different sur surfaces. So a curve number of about 70 is like a well-drained soil forest. Curve number of 100 would be pavement that no water would get through. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here. Uh, you can see here, so if we have this 6.3-inch event falling on a, a forested surface, surface, we'd expect 3 inches of that water to run off. If you go up to 8.5 inches and you have that curved number of 70, right, you have 5 inches running off. That's a big deal for an engineer, right? That's a big difference in terms of the amount of runoff you've seen. If it actually, if you've developed that land to some extent, if you have a curved number of 90, so say that's a residential development with some lawn, you can see uh, you have quite a bit more development. And then one of the things we did do is we also, uh, this is a, a development using low impact design where you actually store a bunch of water actually on the property. Um, another way to, uh, to look at the problem. So then we take these curve numbers, we looked at the watershed, we looked at how the curve number would change across all of these small watersheds, and we use these uh, two tools uh, that are now embedded in uh, GIS systems available from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We do a hydrological modeling with HEC HMS, and then uh, how the water actually flows, a hydraulic modeling with HEC RAS. Um, and so then we looked at, we actually mapped the results. We had uh, LIDAR flown in these areas recently, so we had really good topography. And so we developed a whole series of floodplain maps in the future for every community in the Lamprey River watershed. And we had some big workshops, and we shared all this information. So what you see, it's actually, it's tough to see, but the existing 100-year floodplains are actually in this blue hatching. And then uh, the pink represents... Um, uh, the, what we would say is the updated 2005 conditions, so they represent current conditions with an 8.5 inch event, and then the orange uh, over here represents what the floodplains would be uh, at 2100. So there's, there's actually, there's been almost more change between the flood insurance studies uh, done in the, in the late 1960s, early 70s, and today than there will be in the future. So in some ways we could go and tell people, hey, You've already seen a lot of change. Start designing for the change that you've already seen. Uh, the maps were really instructive for a lot of people. I know they're hard to see and we can't roll them out and look at them. So just to summarize uh, the significant changes that we saw, this was the flood insurance study, so that's based on the, the TP40 and, and how the initial 100-year floodplains were developed for the entire country by FEMA. So the change from there to what we call current conditions in 2005, which is the last period we have land use for, 
The discharge at the one USGS uh, gauge that we have in Packers Falls actually went up 56%. The surface elevation of that 100 foot flood went, from, uh, went up 2.7 feet, so that essentially puts it from underneath the road to over the road, the bridge that goes over Packer Falls, and the 100 year floodplain area actually increased by 20%. This is no small potatoes when you think about most people want to actually live by rivers. So there's, there's plenty of development there already, and at some point I would argue we have to have a pretty significant question about how we don't develop that area in the future. Then if you go from 20, uh, 2005 to 2100, you have, this is an additional increase of 66% in the discharge, additional increase of 4.4 feet in that flood, so we're talking overall, right, a 7 foot increase, and we have flooding of an additional 14% of area. I'll just show you what that actually means on a cross section. What are the implications to groundwater? Uh, well, that's a good question, actually. Nobody's, nobody asked us that in our... Uh, what, what's the implication to groundwater? Um, so, I don't actually know, just from... Uh, I, I, I think we would, we would... I don't know. I know, I, I guess the, what I'm kind of stuck on is that we're now having this very serious conversation about taking the excess water that we have in the spring and pumping it back into our aquifers so it's going to be available for us in summer. Uh, so the groundwater question is not so much like how does, how does it affect flooding, but how do we take this sort of, this plenty that we have and store it, because we're not going to build a big dam in New England. So let's put, pump it back into um, uh, the aquifer. And that's a, there's already been two groundwater studies in the town of Durham, and I think the Department of Environmental Services is getting ready to permit them to put that water back in the aquifer. But we know so little about groundwater. I think is that, I, I have no idea what this would do to it, but I don't think we actually know like where it's coming from and where it's going. A lot of uncertainties there. Well, we know that you know, the coastal water pool is experiencing you know, enhanced saltwater incursion. So, yeah. But away from the coast, like a, just yeah. a result of the development and everything like that? Changes in runoff, how does that? Yeah, I, I don't think we know. I certainly don't know. Uh, so I'll show you one example. This is uh, Route 108 that connects uh, Newmarket and Durham. And, and we pointed at the Durham Boathouse because actually they had a mark on the wall in the last two floods. Somebody had drawn a line on the wall. So we're actually able to use that to calibrate our models. It was a really useful piece of information. But I'm going to show you a cross section on this road. Um, and this road floods all the time, right? And it's, it's the major artery between Durham and Newmarket. So here's the flood insurance study flood at 32.3 uh, feet. So that's what the 100-year floodplain would be mapped at currently. That would be the legal 100-year floodplain. We'd argue that actually 35.2 feet is the actual current 100-year floodplain. Uh, and those are being remapped by FEMA, so we should be getting a new set of flood maps uh, out soon, which is going to show that more people have to buy insurance, flood insurance. And then when we looked at projected 2100-year flood, uh, you, would, you can see that we're now talking right 38.9, 39 feet which we're talking about this road being under 9 to 10 feet of water. Uh, it's probably time to start thinking about this if this is a major uh, transportation route. And then that slight drop down to like uh, 38.5 is what the flood would be if we actually developed in the future using uh, low impact design. So pretty big questions and they're, they're about to rebuild this and what's interesting is because of the studies we've done, the town residents are asking DOT, why don't you build the highway much higher? And DUT is saying, we don't have to, right? We've got the 100-year floodplain study that shows we just need to, to do it a little bit higher. And, and the town residents are really beginning to push the Department of Transportation, which luckily for us in New Hampshire, they're actually beginning to understand that climate change is an issue that they have to deal with. All right, so this whole project, actually, we had a, a really good um, advisory uh, group of external stakeholders, regional planners, municipal planners, nonprofit organizations, and about halfway through the project, we were very enamored with the flood analysis we were doing. And uh, they said, uh, Cam, are towns even going to be able to use this information? And uh, I said, why wouldn't they? be able to use this information. Well, there's a whole bunch of legal ramifications that municipalities might be faced that they wouldn't be able to use something that's a scientific product, but that hasn't been sort of, doesn't have the stamp of approval of uh, FEMA. 
And so uh, we said, that's a really good question. We went out and got some money from the NOAA Sea Grant Law Center and engaged the Vermont Law School in a whole series of questions about would municipalities be able to use this scientific information. So they asked questions about, is a municipality liable for acting or not acting? Does it have the authority to act? Uh, what happens if the maps are challenged? Uh, can a municipal municipality be sued if they decide to take land based on uh, what's shown in the maps? And what options do communities have to protect the health and property within their floodplains? A, a significant set of questions. And actually, uh, John Echeverry and his students worked on this for two years and have developed this, this tremendous 150-page report which I don't completely understand because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not about to give you legal advice, but I'll, I'll share with you the highlights. But it, it's, if, if you're interested, it's online at our, our uh, webpage there, 100 Year Floods. The bottom line is essentially, as long as you follow a transparent process, you're clear about what, you, what it is you're trying to protect, and you clearly cite the information that you're using, municipalities in New Hampshire have considerable leverage to, to make decisions based on the information they have sought. So the bottom line is, even though the maps that we produced aren't legal documents, they can actually be used for a town to change its zoning or to, or to change its riparian rights or to ask people to build buffers or to ask people to build further back uh, from areas in protection uh, of the floodplains. So this is what, it turns out, this is what the municipalities are way more interested in than the new floodplain maps. Can we actually use that information? And the analysis of New Hampshire law indicates that, once again, as long as it's a very transparent process and you're clear about what you're trying to do, you can use it. This is another piece of uh, sort of uh, small victories come from strange places. Um, a lot uh, of our results, we shared them with a lot of different audiences across, uh, across New Hampshire, several people who work for the Department of Environmental Services. And I had talked to the commissioner of DES and says, look, can we change uh, uh, the permitting process so that uh, instead of engineers using this TP40 manual, they actually at least reflect current conditions of 8.5 inches. And he said, Cam, it's a really long process. I don't know what it takes, but we probably have to go to the general court. And they actually, uh, without ever talking to me again, they had actually talked about it amongst themselves and decided that they didn't have to, to tell anybody. They could, it was their permit process, so they could change it if they wanted to. So this, any time you move a lot of dirt in New Hampshire, you have to fill out this alteration of terrain permit application. An engineer does it, and it's several pages long. And so embedded on sort of the bottom of page six, is a, a, a standard of practice, right? Drainage analysis. And they now say that as you do your, your hydrological analysis, your rainfall amount has changed from the Northeast Regional Climate Center, where it used to say TP40. So I could probably do research for another 20 years and would not have an, I, don't, I'm, I hope I will, but could not have an impact that I think will be as big as this is. Now, this might be challenged in court because for an engineering firm, this is a big deal to go from 6.3 to 8.5 inches uh, in their analysis, even if they don't build to it. It's a big change for them. Uh, but I think people at DES understand that it's going to be good if we start adapting uh, today. So, small victory uh, that may have a, a big impact in the future. We've also, we have a little piece of coast. Uh, we're not nearly as vulnerable as Connecticut is. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got 17 miles uh, of coast, uh, and people are beginning to get concerned about sea level rise, although it's interesting different communities are, are uh, being concerned to different, uh, different levels. Uh, clearly, the big challenge here, uh, and this is uh, relatively old, Vermeer and Ramsdorf projections out in the future. They're a little bit lower for the latest IPCC, but sort of uh, about, you know, one to two feet by the middle of the century, two to six feet by the end of the century. And the big uncertainty here comes from the fact that we really don't know what's going to happen with Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, the amount of ice that uh, those ice sheets are dumping in uh, to the ocean is increasing, in, probably in a large part because of ice shelf dynamics and the way warmer sea surface temperatures are changing those ice shelf dynamics. Eliminating the ice shelves and allowing sort of that, taking the cork out of the bottle and allowing that ice to flow down more rapidly to the ocean. But you can see that the rate, so this is uh, a recently uh, science paper by Shepard, sort of the rate of the amount of sea level that's being contributed by Antarctica and Greenland is increasing. Right, so it's, they're probably not going to disappear overnight, but we don't actually completely understand the internal dynamics of this ice sheet. So there's lots of uncertainty. And how is it that you go about talking about this uncertainty with a set of external stakeholders? We'd argue, and what I tell people is, start preparing for a foot by the middle of the century, a couple feet by the end of the century, and science will almost certainly improve these estimates over time. We don't, it's not going to happen tomorrow, although, you know, we dodged a bullet. You guys sort of did with Sandy. We certainly uh, did, 
Um, but the impact of a storm like that is just going to be worse in the future. So at the very least, prepare for something uh, as bad as that. And I show this little cartoon because people say, oh, we have an 11-foot tidal range. You know, what's a couple of feet of sea level rise going to be? Well, the problem is not uh, at low tide. The problem is that a storm that comes in at high tide, and our big storms are usually nor'easters that last two or three days. Uh, so we, we always have something to deal with at high tide, which is where the damage from Sandy came from. And then if you look at our storm surge on the coast of New Hampshire, it's about uh, a, a nine-foot storm surge from a, from a hundred-year storm. Then you add a couple feet of sea level rise, or you add six feet by the end of the century. And if worse comes to worse, you actually have that, you're really unlucky, and you have it in your astronomically highest mean high, high water, which is a couple additional feet in New Hampshire. Uh, this is actually to scale. You start having water coming in the uh, still water coming in the second floor uh, of your building uh, down at uh, Rye Beach. So uh, we actually use this to estimate sort of how high uh, the, this 100-year flood would be uh, in New Hampshire uh, in the future. And if you look at, so, so, so here's the 11.2 feet um, uh, current storm surge. We might get under higher sea level if it happens at king tide, sort of 19.7 uh, uh, feet. And that's above this vertical da datum, NAVD 88. If you put that above mean high, high water, uh, right, we're looking at about 7.2 to 15 feet above mean high, high water. So we went out and drew a series of maps that said, let's take sort of, sort of a middle of the road. We had a flood that was 12 feet above mean high, high water. What would that look like for coastal New Hampshire? And we drew this set of uh, pretty uh, maps. They were done by Chris Watson, Watson from UMass Boston. Uh, and they've, in many ways, they've changed the nature of the discussion uh, in coastal New Hampshire. So let me show you what we're showing here. Uh, this isn't uh, sort of water depth in the ocean. It's, this, is, this represents water depth over the land. So the yellow is zero to three feet over the land, right? The red is three to six feet. The orange is six to nine feet. And the blue is greater than nine feet of water. So I'm showing you a particular piece of, of the southern New Hampshire coast. So Massachusetts starts uh, right here. Uh, this is Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant right here. You'll be happy to see, right? We were very happy to see. They actually built it high enough, maybe, um, at least for this analysis. We could have a bigger storm uh, than this. But you'll see uh, all this. This is all beach. This is all really valuable uh, real estate. This is all houses in here. So this is, these are the sand dunes. This is the big bowl uh, behind the sand dune, and this is Route 1. You can see we're looking at six to nine, the greater than nine feet of water in these communities. Right? This is where almost all of the value in Seabrook resides. And I don't know how this town exists after one of these floods. Right? And this is, these are still water elevations, so we're not capturing the dynamic aspect of the ocean. The same is true for Hampton. Uh, you can see all this area behind the beach, right, under more uh, than nine feet of water. Uh, Hampton just built a $4 million half shell right here for its summer concert series that I can't imagine is going to uh, last a, a decade or two, uh, paid for by New Hampshire taxpayers. So uh, we, we've sort of showed this set of maps to lots of people, and they're able to say, well, we're vulnerable. Where are we vulnerable, and how do we begin to protect ourselves? So we've been involved in a couple of different projects to actually go in and talk to community members about what they can start doing to protect areas that are really significant uh, to them, such as their wastewater treatment plants and their schools and their police stations, and do the economic analysis on how much money they might save if they go about actually spending the money to protect those. All right, so uh, getting close to the end here. Um, one of the ways that we've been uh, taking that message out is by uh, one of the projects that I really have been um, most enamored with that I've been involved in. It's called the New Hampshire uh, Coastal Adaptation uh, Work Group. So it was really an ad hoc group of people that got together from all of these different organizations. And uh, we, we decided that we just want to focus on how it is that we raise uh, the resilience of municipalities in coastal New Hampshire to future flooding, both freshwater and saltwater. And so we've worked with a, a whole bunch of them, but it's the group that has come together uh, that has really begun to make a difference because we've identified vulnerabilities and then we've used that to go out and actually get money to do additional research to answer questions that the community has raised as opposed to what scientists have raised. So we're beginning to really have significant discussions about what communities can do. And we're getting a, a, a wide range of uh, planners and emergency managers interested in this topic without shoving the issue of climate change down their throat. So I never lead in any of these. I sort of sit in the background 
and they don't even say there's a climate scientist in the room. We just talk about how has your community flooded and how can we help you make it more resilient in the future. And we've been making uh, real progress on that front. One of the outcomes is that Durham is now re rewriting their master plan and they now have a climate adaptation chapter that they've included into their master plan. And I went up to Durham, that's right, it's a university town, uh, and actually did a presentation on climate change. You can even see they used our maps on the cover of their report. Uh, so this is the kind of progress that we, we hope to make across uh, the entire region. Um, I was just going to give you a couple of other examples of uh, work we've been doing. We've developed a climate action plan, as every New England state has. I want to actually just show you sort of one of the challenging aspects of our climate action plan. We recommended 67 different recommendations for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one of them was that we want to renovate every house in New Hampshire so that it uses 60% less energy. And so this is, this is turning out to be a vexing problem for me and, and the problem that I actually want to solve. Uh, uh, before I, I move on to something else. Uh, so there's about half a million homes in New Hampshire, so you can see we ramped up the renovations. But on the order, we're doing, when we get up here, we're doing 15,000 renovations of New Hampshire homes per year. Right now, we're building a few hundred homes in New Hampshire, and we're renovating a few thousand. So it's a, it's a remarkable change. And then uh, we ramp up, right, so we get all the renovations done by 2025. Here's the cost of the renovations here. Uh, and then here's the avoided energy cost using very um, conservative estimates of what energy is going to cost in the future. But the real challenge here is that how do we go about raising this, these billions of dollars uh, to renovate these homes when the marketplace does not value energy efficiency, right? The marketplace values granite countertops, extra bedrooms, and extra bathrooms. So there's a huge challenge in how we finance this. And I'm now talking to a, a whole set of community loan funds and people who pool private investments to see what instruments we can't use to actually get private money to help uh, renovate those homes and uh, essentially to develop uh, power purchase agreements with individual homeowners. So they agree to pay a set price for energy for 10 years. Entities come in, renovate the home. They don't use any predetermined technology. They just figure out the best way to save energy for that home. And at the end of 10 or 15 years, the homeowner ends up owning whatever the equipment is. So how we finance this stuff is beginning to, uh, to be a significant question for me. A couple more slides. Uh, uh, we've also recently been funded by the National Science Foundation for a research coordination network to actually engage climate scientists and engineers. Uh, it turns out that this has been a much bigger challenge than the engineers or the climate scientists thought. Uh, one thing, uh, one, one aspect of this came out really early in our uh, uh, our conversations is we were talking about sort of conservative estimates. And when you talk to a climate scientist, a conservative estimate is something he estimates that will almost certainly come true, right? So a conservative estimate for sea level rise is on the lower end. A conservative uh, estimate for an engineer is mean they build the hell out of something so it will withstand anything. So it has completely different meanings to two different groups of people. And it wasn't until our second or third meeting that we started to understand that we were actually using the same word to mean something completely different. But we're really trying to engage a broad group. We're trying to disseminate information, developing a web-based knowledge page, common specifically about climate scientists for engineers, collaborate. We're trying to build a network. And we're really doing this exploration to see if we can't get engineers to really think about designing in a world where climate is not stationary. That's our big challenge. So my last slide. What path will we take to the future? All being all good New Englanders here, we all know Robert Frost's poem about uh, a path diverging in the woods. You guys aren't all New Englanders, but if you're here, you should certainly at least read this poem, right? Um, and so I would argue that we're at this fork in the road in the woods. Uh, uh, and we've been here for 10 years, and we're sort of going down the pathway of uh, using more fossil fuel energy and not really addressing this problem. And I would argue we have to be on the other path. Not only does society have to change, I think the road less traveled for academics is to get more and more engaged in trying to solve societal problems. So I'll stop there and answer your questions.